since you're able, out of respect for God's word, today's text is John chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify him! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize that I have power either to free you or to crucify you? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, First Methodist. So glad to see all of you and everyone that's watching us on TV or live streaming today. Alan, I think if I didn't know better that that would be the wrong scripture for a sermon on politics, but I know better. So it seems a little out of place, seems like one we would read on Good Friday during Holy Week. You know, that scripture is very difficult to read. It's very difficult to read, and it's also very hard to visualize. The passion of the Christ helped all of us see the images that we have been reading in the scripture, and they are very, very graphic. I remember seeing the graphic of them taking the thorns and twisting them and putting them on Jesus' head. I can see him standing there in that purple robe, and his body was so wounded that you couldn't even recognize him. I can still hear the shouts of the soldiers as they mocked him, and the slap in the face, that still pains me. He was the son of God. And what about Pilate? Pilate just cannot make up his mind about Jesus. Was he an innocent man? We see him moving in and out of the palace, running out to the crowds, listening to them, running back to Jesus. Pilate just keeps going back and forth. He really didn't care about anything that Jesus cared about. The lonely, the weak, the sick, he didn't care. He certainly wanted him out of the way. What kind of a politician was he anyway? If he were running for office today, I would not vote for him. Would you? Well, let's move out of chapter 19, the Gospel of John, and go back to the very beginning. And let's see what Jesus was doing early on, and we'll build up to this scene again. So early on in John, Jesus is healing the sick. He is raising the dead. 
He is preaching and teaching and going all over the countryside with his very faithful band of disciples. Great uh, crowds flock to Jesus. So many of them, you could not even count them. One time, it was said that he fed every single one of them and that that was a miracle. There was just something special about this man. He was kind and loving and compassionate. And guess what else? He was not afraid to get his hands dirty. One time he touched a disfigured leper and the man became crystal clean. He took his own saliva and made a mud pack, a poultice of sort, and put it on a blind man's eyes. And guess what? The blind man could see. He saw trees, he saw people, he saw the very, very face of Jesus. And in a town about eight miles south of Nazareth, there was the town of Nain. And in that town, a woman had just lost her only child to death. Whenever a woman, a widow, would lose a child to death, it meant instant poverty. The people were wailing and crying in agony. Can't you hear them? And they had him in a coffin, and they had him, and they were taking him to the city gates. They were marching out together to take his body up to the tombs. Yes, death was walking out of the city gates, but guess who was walking in? Life. Jesus and his band of disciples were walking in as they were walking out. And there was a collision of the two parades right there. And Jesus went over and he put his hand on the boy's coffin and he said something and all of a sudden the boy sat up. He opened his eyes and he was returned to his mother's arms. Isn't it interesting? When Jesus speaks, even the dead hear him. Utter sadness turned to unspeakable joy that day in Nain, and in other towns too. For no matter who Jesus was talking to, he was telling them about the kingdom of God. He said, it's right now. It's yet to come. Now and to come. And everywhere he went, he said, I'm teaching you about things you need to do on earth in my name. And down the line, that will lead to eternal life. He was filled with compassion, with love and forgiveness, unlike all of the religious leaders of that time. They had a message of judgment condemnation, and they wanted to exclude everybody but their own. Jesus was going all over the countryside, upsetting the equilibrium, and he had posed a major threat for all of the people. They wanted him out. They wanted him crucified. They wanted him dead. He had the nerve to proclaim that he was the very Son of God, and that was blasphemy. So let's step back again into our scripture, chapter 19, and we see Jesus standing right in front of Pontius Pilate. Outside, the mobs were raging. Can you hear them shouting? Crucify him, crucify him. Well, Pilate sat on the judgment seat, Jesus stood before him. Beaten within an inch of his life stood the creator of the universe, standing right there. Standing across from him was Pilate, the supreme judge, the governor of Judea. The two men were looking at each other. One was pronouncing the kingdom of heaven the other one was trying to raise a name for himself in his earthly kingdom. And then suddenly, 
just out of nowhere, a messenger comes. The messenger has a note from Pilate's wife, and it said, it's recorded in Matthew 27, verse 19, have nothing to do with that innocent man, because in a dream last night, I suffered much on account of him. Standing in front of Pilate, Jesus was very quiet. The innocent, the poor, the downtrodden were the focus of his ministry. The lowly, the downtrodden meant nothing to Pilate. He would crush them in a second. At that moment, he knew, Jesus knew God's plan for him for the salvation of the world. At that very minute, Pilate knew that if he didn't go, if he went against the wishes of the people, then there would be a revolt, and that would jeopardize his standing with the Roman officials. Wow, all the decisions he had to make. So after rounds and rounds of questioning, he did something very unusual. He asked one of the men to come forward. He took his hands, he put it in the water, and he said, I wash my hands of this man's blood. He dried his hands. I wash my hands of this man's blood. They released Barabbas, and Jesus was taken off to be crucified. My friends, let's stop just a minute and look at a couple of things in our modern day world. In a couple of days, we're going to have a brand new president of the United States of America. Some of us are gonna be very, very happy. Some of us are not gonna be so happy. And some of us are just gonna be perplexed for many, many weeks. Try, I can see you shaking your heads, um, trying to get this whole thing figured out. But no matter who is elected, we have a job to do, not only here in this church, but in our community, our nation, and the whole world. We need to be engaged in politics. We must ensure that all of Jesus' commands to love our neighbor and to care for those that have no voice or those that have no food that is our responsibility to carry that on. If we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, then that is something that we are called to do. We can't just wash our hands and walk away, because if we do, the innocent will suffer. As I was doing my research and looking through the scripture and praying, I came across two wonderful quotes, and the, they were writing articles about why Christians need to be involved in politics. Richard Dozier is one, and Chuck Colson, Prison Fellowship, is the other. Richard said, the Christian must plunge into social and political problems in order to have an influence on the world, not in the hope of making it a paradise, but simply making it tolerable. He adds, God's grace changes people, and as a result, they change everything around them. Families are renewed, schools are rejuvenated, businesses reorient their mission and their purpose, What's more, the gospel of Jesus Christ changes hearts, and that changes the course of civil government. And then Chuck Colson added to it by saying this, human politics is based on the premise that society must be changed in order to change people. But Christians understand it's the other way around. People must be changed to change society. I love that quote by Chuck Colson, and I see it all the time in the many trips I take to Haiti. I don't know whether you know this, but numerous attempts have tried 
been made and tried to help the people of Haiti change that society. It's the, one of the most corrupt governments in the whole world. All kinds of politicians have promised to get in there and do something to change that society. You know their names, Papa Doc, Baby Doc, and Aristide, to name just a few. Power and greed played an important role in everything they did. And you know what? I can tell you, the people are still suffering, particularly the little children. They don't worry about what's going to happen in the week. They worry, how will I get through today? One of the vice presidents of the Mission of Hope emailed me last week, and he said, you're not going to believe what happened. When Hurricane Matthew went over that peninsula, it just wiped out roads, it killed their animals, their crops, disease was just days away. And so they went to the people that owned airplanes and said, we want to rent your airplanes. And they said, oh, that'll be three times the normal cost. The only way to get supplies in there was from an airdrop. And they wanted three times the amount, and they held fast. But who came to their rescue? You know what? A lot of people, it was Christians like you and me and even the own villagers took their meager corn and their meager rice and took it out to some of the people that were dying. It is amazing what has happened there because people, Christians know exactly what to do and they get involved. So back here on the home front, a lot of things are happening. Pastor Andy and I leave on Wednesday, and we're flying to the Mission of Hope to help dedicate a clean water facility for the people of our village. We're really excited because clean water means life. That means babies are going to survive. That means disease is going to dissipate. That means that the water that has bubbled up will be clean and a village will be changed. Hope is bubbling up in that village. So we need to be aware, whatever person is elected, I am asking you to look what their agendas may be. Look at them, read them, study them. A lot is at stake. But I also ask you, as you are going out to do this, be really careful about the mob in your head. The mob in your head will yell, you're too busy. You don't have time to do that. You don't have any talents or skills. But guess what? You do. God gave them to you when you joined the church, and those are your spiritual gifts. Everybody has some. And if you don't know what they are, Google today, Exploring Your Spiritual Gifts, and an inventory from the United Methodist Church will pop up, and you can take it, and you will find out your top two spiritual gifts. And then your job is, is to get out and use those gifts. Romans 12, 6 through 8, confirms that we have these gifts. We have many different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man or a woman's gift is prophesizing, let him do that. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let them encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let them do it generously. If it's leadership, do it diligently. And if it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. God gave you those gifts to use for the church, and you all do a beautiful job. But guess what? The church is not a building per se. The church is a living, breathing organism that's on the move. It's on the move, and it's light. 
You can pack it and you can take it with you wherever you go. If Andy and I go to Haiti, we're taking the church with us. If Rex King sitting right there helps out the wounded warriors and he helps them have a new home or he takes them hunting and fishing, he is taking the church with him. If you are a child advocate, a visitor to the prisons, a mentor at school, someone who volunteers with Project Innocent, if you help with a seeing eye dog, or you're a rocker of tiny babies in the hospital, you're taking the church with you. We move where the Spirit sends us. We don't let our political differences make us sour. We sweeten our world with our work. In 1921, Lewis Laws became the warden at Sing Sing Prison. I don't need to tell you about Sing Sing. It was one of the toughest prisons in the country. He was able, or so they thought, to completely revolutionize that prison. But if you ask him what he did, he would say, oh no, not me, it was my wife, Catherine. She's buried right outside those prison walls. You know, she said, my husband and I are going to take care of these men, and I believe they will take care of me. I just won't have to worry. Well, she was told, don't step a foot in that prison. But the very first basketball game, she took those precious three children of hers, crawled up in the stands, sat with the inmates and watched the basketball game. She studied the men's records, and she looked and found out that one was blind. He was a convicted killer. She went to him and said, do you read Braille? He goes, what's Braille? She taught him how to read. There was another prisoner that was completely deaf, and she went to school to learn sign language so she could make a difference in his life. The prisoners loved her. Unfortunately, she had a car wreck, and she was killed. And an acting warden came that day, and he was taking his morning walk, and he looked at the gates of the prison, and all those rough, tough prisoners were lined up, and they had tears in their eyes. And he knew it was about Catherine Laws. He goes, okay, men, you can go. He opened up the gates, and he let them walk three quarters of a mile to the home where her body was in the casket. They wanted to pay their respects. He had told them, you can go, but come back tonight. You know what? Every single one of them came back. Every single one of them. A little tiny lady made a huge difference to a big institution. Robert Doster said one more thing. When we wash our hands or abandon the public square, what will happen to community values, to ethics, to moral standards? When Christians wash their hands and turn away, who will speak for the poor and the powerless? He said, throughout history, we have seen the Christian influence with helping to get rid of slavery, universal literacy, education, and laws to protect women and factory workers. He said, that sort of impact doesn't come from silence or washing your hands. It comes from being faithful. It's so easy to withdraw. It's easy just to climb in our shell and do nothing. But I think you will probably choose the higher road. I'm sure you won't listen to the mob in your head telling you, you really don't have any gifts. You really can't do it. You know that's from the enemy, and he's trying to get you to do nothing. And it's going to be costly. It's going to cost us something to do this. 
but it was costly for Jesus, and it changed absolutely everything. What are the consequences if we're not faithful? I'm not even going to tell you because you already know. What are the consequences if we are, if we get out there and do those things God has asked us to do regardless of who is elected? You know the answer to that too, don't you? Lives will be changed one person at a time. I have many quotes that go through my head, and I'm hoping they're not from the mob. A lot of them came from my dad, and here's one that he said. When you get to heaven, God is not going to look at you and say, how did you like that car? Did you like your house and your apartment? And what about that carefree life you had? I think he's going to look at us and say, what did you do while you were on earth with the gifts I gave you to build up the kingdom of God? That's something to think about. Friends, as we end today and as we get ready to go to Holy Communion, a lot of Sundays we repeat the Apostles' Creed. And every time we say it, we say these words, He suffered under Pontius Pilate. May it never be said that anyone suffered under us and that our names will be linked to it forever. So go, take the church with you, and by the way, get your hands really dirty. Amen. today. We just have big shoes to fill, and we know we need to get out and help people in your holy name. There's not a better day than to take communion than today. We ask that you would forgive us, give us a new start, and that you would nourish our bodies for the journey ahead. It's in your name we pray. Amen.